Good evening, viewers. Welcome to another session of Know Your Faith. In this series, we have been focusing on the four Marian dogmas as it relates to our devotion to Mary. So as usual, let's begin with prayer. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into our presence, wherever we are participating in Know Your Faith. We thank you for being able to host a series to inform about and spread the Catholic faith to our sisters and brothers. We ask your blessings on our presenter, Father David Kahn, our listeners, those who facilitate this production, that we may be guided by your Holy Spirit in presenting and receiving your word. We pray that all who benefit come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the Catholic faith that will guide our living. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord, your son and our brother, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So our presenter for this series on Marian devotion has been Father David Kahn, a Marian priest of the Archdiocese of Port of Spain. He is also um, a lecturer at St. John Vianney on Marian studies. And during this series, Father has been presenting the four Marian dogmas. He started with scriptia and tradition, locating Mary in both scriptia and the oral tradition of the church. His first um, dogma was divine motherhood. The second that he focused on was perpetual virginity. And last week he focused on the immaculate conception. This week, the final dogma, the fourth and final dogma to conclude the series will be the assumption of our Holy Mother into heaven. And so I present to you, Father David Kahn. So thank you very much, Bernadette. And greetings to all of you. And I truly want to thank all of you for making this journey with the Blessed Virgin Mary, knowing that Our Lady will cover us under her mantle of love and prayer. So as we continue our journey, I also want to thank you for the questions that you have been asking. And in asking these questions to know your fate in a deeper and personal way. So we would like to begin tonight as we focus on the fourth Marian dogma, which is the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So as I mentioned, I truly want to thank you all for the many questions that you have been sending. So the questions will be answered in the presentation and also at the end of the presentation. So we want to continue to hear from you. So please send your question via WhatsApp or at the email address. So the fourth dogma, the assumption of Mary. For Catholic Christians, the belief in the assumption of Mary flows immediately from the belief in her immaculate conception. As last session, it was mentioned that these dogmas do not stand on their own only. They are all interrelated and interconnected. So Mary was immaculately conceived. So Catholic Christians believe that if Mary was preserved from sin by the free gift of God, she would not be bound to experience the consequences of sin debt in the same way we do. Because in Revelation 
chapter 21, verses 25, 27 rather, we read that nothing defiled will enter the kingdom of God. And what makes a person defiled? Sin. So therefore, what God did for Mary at the Immaculate Conception, he does for us in baptism. He frees us from original sin. And being freed from original sin, Mary did not commit any personal sin. So therefore, she's undefiled. So being undefiled, she can enter into heaven. And likewise, unlike us, if we fall into sin, we need to be purified before entering into heaven. So Mary, from the Immaculate Conception, she was freed from sin. She died sinless. So hence the reason the consequence of Mary's death was different to us. So Mary's assumption shows the result of this freedom from sin, the immediate union of a whole being with her son, Jesus Christ, with God at the end of her life. So what is it theological development? On what basis does the church ask us to believe in this doctrine? Luigi Gambiro observed that disbelief is based on what we believe about Jesus. Again, as the previous session, I keep repeating for us to really understand Mary, we have to understand what are we saying about Jesus? And it is based on what we are saying about Jesus is what we believe about Mary. So this testifies on behalf of something that Christian tradition has always emphasized. The immediate connection between the mystery of Christ and the mystery of his mother Mary's bodily glorification in the eternal life expresses the church's fate in the final glorification of man. Saved by Jesus Christ in the totality of his person, in the flesh of Christ and in the flesh of Mary, both of whom were taken up into the glory of heaven. So Jesus was taken up into the glory of heaven. And so it is with Mary, the escal theological humanity of the redeemed is already present. So immediately is not whether Mary died, but it is really a question being taken up into heaven. Jesus died and he was taken up into heaven. And likewise, Mary dies and she is taken up into heaven. So the dogmatic constitution on the divine revelation, De Verbum, in the Second Vatican Council number nine, paragraph nine, it says to us, sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Our first session dealt with this, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, knowing that truth is revealed in both. And this is a firm in De Verbum, in the Second Vatican Council. They say that they are bound closely together and communicate with the other for both of them flowing out of the same divine wellspring. So scripture flows from the wellspring of God's grace. Divine revelation also flows from this this wellspring of grace, and it come together in some fashion to form one thing and move together towards the same goal. And what is this goal? The goal of truth. So therefore, the scripture is, review, is revealing truth. The tradition, as a church looks back at the tradition, the constant faith, the paradosis, it is looking for truth. So 
in paragraph 10 in De Verboom, thus it comes about that a church does not draw her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Hence, both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. And when it comes to the dogma of Mary, the dogmas of Mary, it is where the scripture and the tradition really meets. So the sacred tradition and sacred scripture makes up a single sacred deposit of the word of God, which is entrusted to the church. It goes further to say, tradition may be recognized as a universal agreement that a truth has been revealed through the bishops of the world, church fathers, the constant teaching of the theologians, liturgy, as well as the belief and devotion of the faithful. So some doctrines are implicitly revealed in other doctrine, as for the instant, Mary assumption reflects upon Jesus's resurrection and the truth of the resurrection of the body. So therefore, it may not be implicitly revealed, but we know about the resurrection of Jesus, the truth of it, and bodily resurrection. So in short, Catholic Christians believe that the Blessed Virgin Mary at the end of her earthly life was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. That is what we are called to believe. In fact, in the rosary prayer, in the liturgy of the church, the rosary, in the fifth glorious mystery, we focus on the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Likewise, August 15th, every year, the church celebrates the feast, the solemnity of the Assumption of Mary. So what does the New Testament have to say? So the New Testament teaches us, therefore, just as through one person, sin entered the world, and through sin, death, and thus death came to all, in as much as all has sinned. So we know that death comes to all, just as sin comes to all, but it does not mean that all have to sin. Jesus did not sin. The Blessed Virgin Mary did not sin, and we and we have an option not to sin, or we could choose sin. And sad to say, many people choose to sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that is a crucial part. The eternal life in Christ Jesus is a gift from God. So when we are freed from sin, we will be given that gift of life. So Mary did not sin. So she was given the gift of life, the resurrection of the body. But because Mary did not sin, she did not need a new body. So her body and soul undefiled was raised to the glory of God. So further, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 to 26, we read, for since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead came also through a human being. For just as Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life, but each one in proper order. Christ, the first fruits then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy 
to be destroyed is death. And this scripture is also linked to Revelation 12. In Revelation chapter 12, it speaks about the woman, the woman who dressed with the sun will bring about the one who will destroy sin and death. Her seed will bring about this and they will cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So we see that that woman in Revelation 12 is actually the blessed Virgin Mary. The same woman mentioned in Genesis chapter three in the Old Testament as dealt with last day in the Immaculate Conception. The one that there is enmity between Satan, sin. So Mary is that person. So since sin and death are the fruits of Satan, the freedom of Mary from the original sin of Adam, the Immaculate Conception, also frees her from the consequences of sin also, because she did not sin. So there is no consequence of sin in her life. So that then Mary best fulfills the scripture of Genesis. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, Satan, and the woman, Mary, and between your offspring, the minion of Satan, and hers, Christ. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. So looking at Genesis 3.15 and Revelation chapter 12, you will see the connection. This woman is Mary. And in John's gospel, chapter 19, how does Jesus refer to Mary? Woman, behold your son. And son, behold your mother. So looking at the constant fate of the church, the constant fate of the church is what happened throughout the centuries. From the very early fifth into the sixth century, there was a belief of Mary dying, yes, dying, but then as they were taking her body for burial, her body disappeared. Her body was raised to the glory of God. Also in the written work of the father, there's a beautiful story that they heard an angel re reveal that Mary was going to die. So she went to sleep. And as she went to sleep, all of the apostles from every part of the world came. And they were with Mary and she talked and she spoke with them. And then she went to sleep. And as she went to sleep, she died. And as she died, three days later, Jesus appeared with the apostles and Mary. And as he appeared with the apostles and Mary, Mary was taken up into heaven. So in the very early part of the church, it was known as Mary's sleep. And the word that is used, Domitian. So like dormitory, a place of rest. So Domitian. So in the Eastern church, early as the sixth century, they started to celebrate the sleep of Mary, the Domitian of Mary. So from the fifth century, the Feast of the Assumption of Mary was celebrated in Syria. The fifth and sixth century, the apocryphal books were testimony of a certain Christian sense of the adherents felt that the body of the mother of God should lie in a sepulcher. That is a story that I just said. So they were taking the body of Mary. She died. And while they were taking the body to this sepulcher, the body was taken up into heaven. So the sixth century, the Feast of the Assumption was celebrated in Jerusalem and perhaps even in Alexandria. From the seventh century, clear and explicit testimony was given on the Assumption of Mary in the Eastern Church. As I mentioned, the Feast 
of your mission. The same testimony is clear also in the Western Church Gregory of Tours. So if you do a bit of research in the fathers of the church concerning the assumption of Mary, you will have the written work of the fathers speaking about Mary dying, going to sleep, and then disappearing. So through the century, so that the ninth century now, the Feast of the Assumption was celebrated in Spain. And then from the 10th to the 12th century, no dispute. There was no dispute whatsoever in the Western church. There was dispute over the false epistle of Jerome on the subject. So therefore, some of the written works that were disputed but they believe that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. So the 12th century continuing, the Feast of the Assumption was celebrated in the city of Rome and in France. And in the 13th century to the present, certain and undisputed faith in the assumption of Mary in the universal church. So most scholars today accept the assumption of Mary. So in 1950, Pope Pius XII, he declared infallibly ex cathedra. And last day's session, I also explained infallible, meaning without fault, without fault when a pope sits on his cathedra, his chair, and he speaks on faith and morals and doctrines. And here, Pope Pius XII, he's going to proclaim the dogma of the assumption. So this is what he says, Mary having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul to heavenly glory. Taking that statement, Mary having completed the course of her earthly life was assumed body and soul to heavenly glory. That is the dogma in a nutshell. So what is the final words? The man magisterium, this is the official teaching of the church, has stayed conspicuously silent regarding whether this process entail Mary's physical death. So the church never says anything about her physical death. The teaching merely states that Mary's body and soul was assumed at the completion of the course of Mary's life. And that is our journey. At the end of our life, we need to be purified to enter into the glory of God. Revelation 21, 27, nothing defiled will enter the kingdom of God. What makes a human person defiled is sin. Mary was created immaculately, immaculate conception. She did not have personal sin. So at the natural end of her earthly life, she was undefiled, so she was taken body and soul into the glory of God. So just to let you know from now that our session on Mary has come to an end on this final Monday of this month of May, the month of Mary. So we look forward to the new topic to come next month. You'll hear more about that. So please, we want to hear from you. So do send your questions via email or WhatsApp. So I welcome back Bernadette to a dialogue now on the questions and what she heard coming out from this dogma. So thank you very much, Father, for another enlightening session. And very much we saw that the assumption really 
is based on the foundation of the Immaculate Conception. Um, the Immaculate Conception, Mary was created and redeemed at the same time. What happens to us in our baptism happened to Mary at the moment of her conception. And because she was sinless, then I think that is one of the assumptions. Because she was sinless, her body itself, though she may have died, her body was not corrupt and went body and soul into heaven. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit further on the marriage of the two? So I know you mentioned it in your talk there, but just to elaborate a little bit on Mary sinless um, being created and redeemed at the same time in Immaculate Conception. And that relates to the assumption of her body and soul into heaven, more so her body. Um, how does that relate to us? Well, it relates to us because it is really our hope that we recognize that if we free ourselves from sin, we will enter into the glory of God. So in this life, we will be faced with many obstacle challenges, but it does not mean that we need to give in into temptation and fall into sin. Here, Mary Yes, she was immaculately conceived, but God freed her from original sin. He frees us. She would have been faced with very difficult circumstances in life, trials and tribulations. She would have been faced with temptation, but she did not give into sin. We, however, in giving into sin, nothing defiled will enter the kingdom of God. But again, God in his merciful love gave us the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation so we can be free from sin to enter into his glory. So it gives us hope to recognize human beings that one just like us, that we can overcome sin in many facets. Yes, it will be a struggle, but with God's grace, nothing is impossible. So that is what is a beauty of this dogma and for us to concretize in our minds and heart that God wants us to be with him. From the very beginning, if we looked at Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were created with body and soul and God wanted to walk with them in the cool of the evening, but because of sin, he could not walk with them in the cool of the evening. So therefore, Mary did not sin. So hence the reason that she is making this beautiful journey, this walk with God in his glory. Yes. Um, I want to go a little more into Marian spirituality, but one of the foundations for understanding Marian spirituality as you focus in the first session was scripture and tradition. And our church is really not sola scriptura, meaning everything is just biblical. Actually, the Bible came after the tradition, and the tradition continued even parallel to the Bible. So the two really go hand in hand, tradition and sacred scripture. So could you talk a little bit to give us a... Um, uh, uh, even greater understanding, wider than Mary, but many, many things in our church are based on not just sacred scripture, but also tradition. Yes. So hence the reason why I, I felt it very important to begin this session, connecting it up with the first session on scripture and tradition and quoting from the official document of the church Dei Verbum, because we know there is revealed truth in tradition. So truth is being revealed, just like every religion has truth in it, but we have to determine the truth. And how do we know something is truthful? You look at the constancy over time. And in the constancy of what is revealed, you know it to be truthful because God is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever in Hebrews chapter 4. So the truth does not change because God is truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Pilate questioned, what is truth? So therefore, truth is being revealed. And this truth, we look now at what is revealed in the tradition. What is being revealed is their constancy to it. Hence the reason why we turn to scripture. We turn to other sources, other traditions. What did people say? And from that, it forms what is called the deposit of faith. Meaning deposit because over the centuries, people have believed this. So they, because of that faith, they deposit that faith. So it's, it makes up part of the deposit of faith. So hence the reason why the Catholic Church have always hold that every single religion has truth in it. And, and we can discover the truth in every religion. We may not agree with certain things, but some things remain truthful in every religion. For example, every religion believes that at the end of our journey, we are to return to our God. There is freedom. So therefore, that is a truth. It happens differently. And likewise, to pinpoint some of the Christian things that we don't see coming out directly from the scripture, but we know it is in the scripture and the tradition, the belief in the Trinity, because we will not find the word Trinity in scripture, but we know there's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will not see the word incarnation, but we know that Jesus was a word made flesh. So certain wording you may not see, but it does not mean that it is not truth. A very simple example is if we should go to one of the tribes in the Amazon and we try to explain to them the internet, they may not believe us, but not believing does not mean it does not exist. So truth always exists. So it's up to us to believe it or not. Yeah. And to highlight what you are saying there, Father, let's talk a little bit about apparitions. We have the approved ones and we have apparitions not yet approved. They are before the church and are being examined. So we don't just take an apparition if somebody says, no matter how many people visit the site, based on the apparition, we don't just take it and declare it as authentic. The church goes through a process. Could you just give us a little basic outline of how it goes, maybe Fatima or Lourdes or one of the approved apparitions? So let me deal with the approved one, Lourdes, since we looked at the Immaculate Conception. So after everything is said, the church examines again all that has been said. The church will look at the scripture. It will look at the tradition to see the constancy of faith. Has this continued throughout the century? And if it has, then the church will proclaim, well, this is what we are called to believe and accept it as a proof apparition. So let me use a place that has not been approved, Medjugorje. Many people have gone to Medjugorje. I myself have gone, and I have seen signs, wonders, and miracles. No doubt about it, because medical cures people have examined. Why did the church not approve Medjugorje as yet? Why? Because some of the visionaries at Medjugorje, they still receive visions even up to day. So therefore, the church is not saying it is not a holy place. It's not that signs, wonders, and miracles are not happening. It is only when it stops, then they have to look at everything, and then they will give the place as a proof. It does not mean that you cannot visit, but the church is saying, right now, it is your personal belief. You could choose to believe or not believe. It will not affect your faith. But if you 
you look for the positive to strengthen your faith. So hence the reason why, whereas Lutz, um, all that has been said has stopped, miracles still continue. So the church has approved it. But today, there are still visionaries who are still getting messages. So they have to look at what I said earlier, the deposit of faith to see whether or not it is constant before giving the stamp of approval. Yeah, and I think this is very interesting, especially since this session on Mary is not just to give information, but is to strengthen our own spiritual life and to support us as Catholic Christians in our journey of faith. And it's important for us to understand that the Catholic Church, so even when it comes to the Eucharist and believing that it is really the body and blood of Christ, there's a lot of divine revelation. And some, again, um, the Church have approved, and some, it's still before the Examination Council. Um, for us viewers, I think it is very important for us to understand that the church does not simply declare something as a miracle or declare something as being approved as a divine revelation, but it takes its time, sometimes hundreds of years. Um, it does not only use the Catholic um, authorities to do the investigation, but it uses a lot of independent non-Catholic labs and, and doctors and so on to verify, for instance, the cures in Lutz um, will go through a series of doctors, not only Catholics, and many times in um, approving these uh, apparitions, miracles, um, divine revelations, the church will use people who are even against the church, who are not yes. for the church. You know, so whether it's true or not, so it could be really objective. So I really want the viewers to appreciate that in building the dogmas, also a dogma doesn't just suddenly come with a, a meeting and a group of people and they say they agree. As Father outlined in this session, it was not just um, dogma based on one source, but it was dogma based on theologians over the ages and he outlined um, the centuries where it was observed without being declared, not until 1950 wasn't declared as a dogma, but way back in the ninth century, we saw the practice of uh, um, Our Lady of the Assumption being honored. And it came through a series of different types of investigations and um, study also, so you had theologians, you had church fathers and so on, coming together over a long period of time before a dogma is really declared. So once a dogma is declared, it's a sacred truth and a deposit of faith, and that should play a part in our spirituality. So now, Father, I want to get into a little discussion on Marian spirituality, and you yourself are very Marian priest. So could you give us a few examples of how you practice your Marian spirituality and it helps you and supports you in your own faith journey? Well, the example that I, I love to use is Mary's fiat. My own Marian spirituality. What is Maria? What is the Marian spirituality, the fiat? It is Mary, yes to the Lord. She says, yes. You know, and I think about Mary saying yes. And many times in life, you know, we have to say yes, we have to say no. And to be firm in our resolve, because yes is a perfect answer as well as no. So yes to what is good and no to what is bad. So that is part of my life. So my yes will be yes, my no will be no. Also, as a priest, for those who have struggled believing in the body and blood of Jesus, um, Corpus Christi will come very soon, the body and blood. So whenever the horse is held up, even before I was a priest, and that horse is held up, and the priest says, body of Christ, and when I say amen, because amen means so be it. I see that as like Mary's fiat saying yes, because when Mary 
said yes, what she was saying yes, was to receive Jesus in her body to become his mother. So I am going to receive Jesus in my body. So yes, I believe that this is Jesus. And there are many instances similar to this. So the way that I treat people, so Mary's visitation to Elizabeth, Mary, how she went to look after her cousin, that, you know, when she heard that her cousin was already in her six month, she left. So therefore, going to help people, Marian spirituality, reaching out. And the part that I like to highlight is when Mary visited Elizabeth, she brought a great blessing because it says the child in her womb left for joy. And the child we know is John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Spirit. So when I visit people, I ask myself, do I bring joy to people? Or people say, he again? Or when I leave them, are they filled with the Holy Spirit? You know, that whole spirituality of hospitality that when we encounter people, they're supposed to be in a better place. And the many instances of Mary's life, last day I mentioned, on his spirituality, learning not to react, but to respond. Mary pondered and cherished all things in her heart that we sometime before we react, let us sit back and ponder so we will respond. So there are so many gems of Mary. That is why I firmly believe she is a true mother because a mother is the one that nurtures give an example. So she's truly the mother of the whole church, the mother of heaven and of earth. Yeah, one particular thing I remember you sharing in a retreat um, when you were discerning whether you wanted to be a priest or not. And you shared that Anthony Pantin, after seeing him, he told you to go and pray and you went to pray at a particular church and you smelt roses and you felt it, but you were asking Mary to help you to answer whether you should become a priest and to the seminary or not. So you want to just share that, elaborate that little experience. I thought it was miraculous. It always stays with me and many times when I have big decisions based on you sharing that I had started to say, Mary, help me, give me a little sign. Yes, because so let me say this so it's a bit of testimony on my own journey so first to begin when i was younger i never taught about becoming a priest that was the first this thought in my mind to become a priest and likewise when i did make the decision to become a priest i met with archbishop anthony panting way back in 1990. And when I met with him, he said to me, go and pray about it. And I went to Rosary Church because at that time I was teaching at Rosary Boys RC School. And those of you who know Rosary Church is not the best smelling church in the world because it is an open church and all sorts of people enter the church with his beauty, all is welcome. And because of it, there was a stench in the church, I remember distinctly. And then I asked Mary, as I said, you know, you are mother. So place me under your motherly care. Help me to say yes, if it is the will of God. And then I got the sweet smell of roses. And therefore our mother helps. Many times in the night, after a long day, situations in my life, there is, you know, trials and tribulations, as I said, and I asked Mary, I need your comfort. And after asking Mary, inviting her like a mother, because that's what a child does, you invite your mother when things happen. And what happens? I'm able to sleep, as you say, as a baby. What I hold through is to the commandments of God. One commandment says, honor your mother and father. And 
Mary is a mother of Jesus. So therefore I know if I ask my mother to ask my brother Jesus, he cannot be disobedient. Obviously, if it's something bad, she will not ask, but if it's something good, because you know, a mother, faith. This is a woman who has faith. So when I think my faith is, is weaning or I don't have enough faith, because how does Jesus answer us always? Scripture teaches us. He says, your faith. So I turn to Mary to strengthen my little faith to also ask. And that is what you remember. So I had faith now because I said I was not thinking about being a priest. And I said, well, I need a little strengthening of faith. So I turned to Mary and that is where the confirmation came. And doing the will of God, we always need God's grace. And I remember in Legion of Mary, we had to focus a lot on Mary being the mediatrix of grace. And um, our leader, this is how she described it, that there's a tank of grace and Mary is a tap. So when you turn on that tap, the grace is flow. So Mary is a mediatrix. She's like the tap to the tank of grace. And I really do feel also that many times when you pray um, through Mary, you pray the rosary, you pray um, and you do any Marian devotion, um, whether it's a novena, whatever you are doing, any Marian devotion, your faith is strengthened. You have the grace to do God's will. So I really do think that if it is one thing we want to encourage you viewers in this series, as you have understood Mary as a mother, Mary and her immaculate conception, the assumption and also her perpetual virginity that allows us allows Mary to be all our mothers. And we can really appreciate that she's also the mediatrix of grace. And when we practice devotion to Mary, she allows grace to come to us in a powerful way. Not that we cannot pray directly to God for that, but Mary enhances it. Father, could you just tell us how you could pray directly to God? Yes, but how Mary enhances our prayers. Mary enhances our prayers, as I just said, faith, the ingredients needed for our prayer to be efficacious is faith. We see this in scripture, your faith. So therefore, when we think we do not have faith, we know that Mary is a woman of faith because of that fiat saying yes to God. She trusted God her all. So hence the reason why it is so important because faith marries a woman of faith that is why we turn to her so we do not pray to her but we ask her to intercede we ask her to intercede and when we ask mary to intercede to pray with us she's going to ask jesus so galatians make it very clear that Jesus is born of a woman. He's born of Mary. It also says that there's one mediator between God and man, which is Jesus Christ. So therefore, when we ask Mary, she is going to ask Jesus. So John chapter two, the wedding feast at Cana. What did Mary do? Mary asked Jesus. She didn't do it. She knew that the wine ran out, but she said, do whatever he tells you. So is asking Mary to ask Jesus. Many people say, well, why don't you go? As you just said, well, sometimes we don't go because one recognize our faith may not be strong enough. So therefore we ask the woman of faith to assist us. So that is really Mary's assistance in our prayer life, a life of faith, because no doubt about it, she is the woman of faith. Yeah. And as you brought in the wedding at Cana, I think that is a really um, a scripture that really relates to Mary as intercessor. And just as we find in the world today, it's important to have intercessors interceding for the issues of the world. Shouldn't we value Mary as this really pure intercessor? Because we have more at this point in time, as I look on my chat and all of that, I see people adding me on to all kinds of intercessory groups. So we have 
tons of intercessors right now because they are seeing the need for it. And here we have a very pure intercessor. Shouldn't we value her as intercessor even more? Yes, because even so, did Jesus not say to his disciples, go, go and pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit? And what does Acts of the Apostle? They could have prayed on their own. Jesus tell them, go and pray. But who was present with them at prayer? The Acts of the Apostle, Mary was there. Because the Apostle recognized they are praying with a woman of faith. The same woman who was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, the same spirit given to us in baptism, she has, so she can, can also pray with us. And we must negate that acts because many people talk about the spirit. They could have prayed on their own, but they prayed as you use with a pure vessel, the immaculate conception, the divine mother, the perpetual virgin they prayed with, for the coming of the Spirit. That's interesting because just now we'll be celebrating Pentecost and many of us will be praying the Novena to the Holy Spirit. And it will be very important for us if we could do just like the apostles. They prayed with the Holy Mother at their side and as part of them. So for us to incorporate her in our prayers and pray with her um, for the coming of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, Father, can you summarize for us and include in your summary how we can live a more Marian or devoted to Mary to strengthen our own faith life? So add that on to your summary of what you have done in this series so far. So in this series dedicated to Mary in the month of May, we looked at scripture and tradition. It is very important for us to direct our lives with the scripture and tradition, the truth of our faith. Mary lived the truth. So she is part of scripture. She's part of the tradition. And in the scripture and tradition, we see her as divine mother. She's divine mother because she carried Jesus in her body. We likewise, if we think about this divine motherhood of Jesus, we can think about whenever we receive the Eucharist, we are carrying Jesus in us. So therefore, what is expected of us? If we are to nurture the child Jesus, how will we nurture? Will we nurture people to obedience of goodness to bring about blessings? As we move into the Immaculate Conception, Mary, what God did for Mary at her immaculate conception, he does for us at our baptism. Mary did not sin after immaculate conception. When we are baptized, do we really live out the creed that we profess? Do we fulfill the baptismal creed to reject Satan and to believe in God? The parents and godparents who say that for the child, those who are not baptized as adults, by your example, have you really been a divine mother? And the, and the way I use divine mother here, I'm using a holy person to direct your child. So we see that in Immaculate Conception. Likewise, the perpetual virginity. Can we be chaste in our lifestyle? Because we know the world we live in is so rooted in, 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 in sexual sin, so rooted in pornography. Can we not be chaste and really uphold married life and promote the marriage, the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman? So therefore, the end result will be a child, a family, a whole, like the holy family of Nazareth, so, therefore, in our perpetual virginity, an example of being chaste for God. And likewise, the assumption, knowing that God longs for us to be in glory, for us to be with God in glory, in body and soul. Well, nothing defiled will enter the kingdom of God. So, we learn from this example 
that we must be free from sin. That when we have an opportunity to do good, we do good. And what is a good thing to do when we sin, we repent. So that we too will be in the glory of God with Mama Mary and Papa God. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you for this great series that you have done enlightening us on the four Marian dogmas and how we could strengthen our devotion to Mary so she can help us on our faith journey. Thank you, viewers, and we pray God's blessing and we consecrate Father and you viewers to our Holy Mother as we pray that she protects you with her mantle, she pray for you, she cover you in her mantle of love, prayer and protection. And I thank you, organizers. Um, Father, it was an honor sharing this platform as a moderator. So now I hand over to Gary. Thank you very much, Bernadette. And all it is left for me to do at this time is to say thank you to Bernadette for expertly moderating these five sessions. Thank you very much, Bernadette. Um, and of course, Father David, for your expert knowledge on, on Marian devotion and theology and spirituality. We want to thank you very much for leading us through these sessions in this month of May, uh, May the month of Mary. So thank you very much on behalf of Credi, Office of Pastoral Planning and Development, and Campsell, the producers of Know Your Faith. And I want to encourage your viewers that we will be moving into apologetics during the month of June. Father Robert Christo will be back with us to share on different topics and he has creatively um, worded these topics. So the first session would be on purgatory. You know, when people say when you're dead, you're done. So that's his, that's his, his sub theme for the first session. And then canon of the Bible. People like to say, show me in the Bible, show me in the Bible. So that's his sub theme. And then thirdly, the third week of June, he will be dealing with the papacy. Mind leader is Jesus. And then fourthly, the fourth Monday of June, hot topics, hotter than a chula. So we look forward to Father Robert Christo on apologetics, and we would really like you to invite the family, bring the family on and um, to look at it on, on Trinity TV, Trinity Facebook, uh, Trinity YouTube, Camsel, um, Tr Catholic TT Facebook and YouTube and Credi's uh, Facebook. So we invite you to bring the family, invite a friend to join us on the Mondays of June for apologetics. So Father, could you then close the series with your final prayer? Sure. So in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. So almighty ever living God, we thank you for this beautiful month of May, the month of Mary, whom you have given to the whole world as mother, we ask her continual intercession as she prayed with the apostles, that she will pray with us, that we will be renewed in the spirit of God to live a life of truth so that we will bring about the kingdom here on earth. So may your mother continue to hold us in her mantle of love, interceding now and forever at the hour of our death so we will be blessed by you as we all say together wherever you are hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee bless her thou mount's woman and bless the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners now amen. at the hour of our death amen the lord be with you and with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Good night, everyone.